Now, we're concluding our series called Live in the Light, a chapter-by-chapter -chapter study of the book of 1 John. 1 John 4, 1. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. If a person is claiming to be a prophet and acknowledges that Jesus came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. Verse four, but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we are grateful for your word. Today, we lay aside all distractions, all anxiety, everything that's distracting us right now, we set it at your feet and we give you our full undivided attention. I ask that you'd be strong in my weakness and make ready the hearts of men to receive the word of truth. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray and everybody said, <clears throat> amen. The context here to the book of 1 John is he is writing a warning to the early church to expose false teaching that had crept its way into the early church. John rightly was aware that the greatest threat to the New Testament church was not the government or the ideology of culture. The greatest threat to our faith comes from within by false teachers who infiltrate the church and preach another gospel. So he writes this warning to Jewish believers and Greek believers to warn them to cling to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and do not be deceived by false teachers. The, we're gonna work our way down this verse by verse and the first major point today is don't believe every preacher. Look at your neighbor, the one you've been ignoring and say, don't believe every preacher. Don't believe every preacher. And hey, that goes for this one if I ever deviate from the Bible. I would encourage you to bring the Bible to church with you. Bring it, and hey, listen, I know it's great that you got it on your phone and the digital stuff, that's great. Bring that old thing, bring the book, bring the Bible with you. You wouldn't show up to a war without a weapon, would you? So you need to bring the word of God and study it. And if I ever tell you something contrary to the scripture, don't believe me either, all right? There were many false teachers in the world during John's day, and I would dare to say there are even more now than ever before. Jesus even warned, and all throughout the New Testament, it's filled with warnings that tell us that in the last days, perilous times will come, and men will refuse sound doctrine, and they will search out teachers who will tickle their ears and give them a pleasing soothing, not confrontational, politically correct, palatable message. We should be warned. Why does John warn us? Because false teachers are hard to detect. What does a false teacher look like? Looks like a true teacher. You know, we concoct in our mind, well, a false teacher probably has obvious giveaways. You know what I mean? Maybe they're super flashy. Maybe they're real prideful or arrogant or, you know, maybe I just get the creeps when I hear them talk. No, 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 no. False teachers look, sound, and act like true teachers. So you have to be careful that you are able to discern the spirit that is at work. Satan even disguises himself as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 says, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. He appears good. Scripture implies that at one time he was Lucifer, light bearer, one of the most beautiful angels in all of heaven. Satan is not red with horns and a pitchfork running around stabbing people. He is illustrious. He is captivating. He is alluring. And he appears to be good. Be careful that you are not deceived 
because many of Satan's ministers masquerade as servants of righteousness, but they are wolves in sheep's clothing. Many who are wolves in sheep's clothing, they don't preach hatred or anger or wrath or violence. In fact, their message is often very subtle. It's very palatable. And most often it is under the disguise of acceptance and tolerance and everything goes and everything is okay and we love everybody. And of course, the true church, we love everybody. Everybody is welcome. But the truth is we come to Jesus as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Former things pass away and all things become new. They appear tolerant, accepting, and kind, and they, are, they appear very loving, false teachers do, but they are ravenous wolves who lead many astray through the deception of false teaching. Most false teachers have a low view of scripture. They do not believe in the entire inspired, inspired word of God. They believe that it is more of a suggestion and that their culture can usurp the authority of the word of God. But one of the other red flags of a false teacher is that they preach a Jesus conformed to their image rather than conforming themselves into his image. It's happening all throughout your city and in America and around the world right here, right now. People are preaching a Jesus, but it is not the Jesus of the Bible. It's called idolatry to attempt to manipulate or form God into our likeness. But I want you to understand, Romans tells us, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We do not ask Jesus to agree with us. We do not manipulate him to make him fit our worldview. No, we submit to him and his lordship, not the other way around. I'm gonna give you three major keys of identifying a false prophet. Number one, what do they say about Jesus and the Bible? What do they say about Jesus and the Bible? You remember Jesus asked this question of his disciples. He said, who do men say that I am? They responded, well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're a true prophet. But then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus responded, upon this rock will I build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. He's not just talking about Peter being the rock of the church, rather Peter's statement that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, that is the rock, the bedrock, the foundation of the New Testament church. Be careful of anybody who minimizes Jesus. That is the number one giveaway of a false prophet is they minimize Jesus. Be careful of anyone who downplays his deity, his humanity, his death on the cross, or his glorious resurrection. You see, that's what was happening here in 1 John. He's writing again to stamp out false teaching But the false teaching of his day was Gnosticism. And from a 30,000 foot view, the Gnostics believed that Jesus was divine, but they rejected his bodily indwelling. They rejected that Jesus was a man. They rejected that he really died a physical death and a physical resurrection. Their worldview was the divine could not intermingle with carnality and the appetites of the flesh So they accepted him as deity, but they denied him in his humanity. They were minimizing Christ. That's why John writes this letter. If anybody preaches that he came in a body, they're speaking from the spirit of God. In chapter one, he says, I have seen him. I have touched him. I'm an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus. Be careful of anybody who downplays or minimizes Christ. That is the spirit of antichrist at work within them. 1 John 2.22 says, and who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. Anyone who denies the Father and Son is an antichrist. 
pretty bold words there, right? He's telling us how he really feels. If you deny or minimize Christ, you have the spirit of antichrist that is at work within you. And number two, do they minimize the Bible? Do they minimize the Bible? And this is the one that is rampant in 2023. People will have a high view of Jesus, but a low view of scripture. Let me warn you, it is impossible to have a low view of scripture and an accurate view of Jesus. They're inseparable. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And all things that were made were made through him and by him. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You cannot separate the scripture from Christ. Jesus said it this way. He said, in the scriptures, you search them and you think you find eternal life, but the scriptures speak of me. He was literally saying that from Genesis to Malachi, the entire Old Testament, it foreshadowed and it pointed forward to Christ. The Bible is about Jesus. It's about him. People say, well, you know, Jesus didn't talk about this issue. He didn't talk about that issue. He didn't talk about sexuality, you know. So where Jesus is silent, you know, culture can fill in the blanks. False? Pump the brakes, homie? Jesus preached the Old Testament, and the Old Testament covers all that thoroughly. And Jesus did not teach the Old Testament as a suggestion. He taught it as the authoritative word of the living God. He taught it as it was his Father's declarative word. So if Jesus affirms the scripture, we must affirm the scripture. And if somebody preaches a Jesus that doesn't line up with the scripture, that's not Jesus. And while I'm here, just for fun, do you realize that the Bible you hold in your hand is an absolute miracle? It's not a book, it is a library. 66 books written by 40 different authors spanning 1,000 800 years on three continents in three languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, written by fishermen, tax collectors, shepherds, and kings. Yet they all write in perfect harmony and unison God's plan to save the world through his precious son, Jesus Christ. I could show you the gospel in the first three verses of Genesis, the whole Bible is about one story, the plan of redemption through Jesus Christ, the Lord. That's a miracle. It's a miracle. If you, if you tried to recreate it today, it would be utterly impossible. Try getting 40 people to agree on anything, especially now. If we started today and we ended in 1,800 years and we asked doctors, fishermen, lawyers, presidents to describe the cure for one illness how many of you know when that thing was done, that would be crazy. Yet you have a work of the Holy Spirit in your hand. Don't let some unbelieving person suppress the truth of God in your life. I've studied this word for many, many years, and the more I've studied it, the more I've become profoundly convinced that it is divine, it is inspired, and it is the word of the living God. Beware of anybody who minimizes Christ or minimizes the Bible. The second key indicator of a false teacher is do they preach a simple gospel? Do they preach the simple gospel? The gospel is Christ's life, death, burial, and resurrection. It is best summarized in Ephesians chapter two, which says, while we were dead in our sin, lost in our trespasses, God was rich in mercy towards us as he gave his only son, Salvation is not a reward for the righteous. It is a free gift for sinners. It's profound, church. It's beautiful. It may sound like foolishness to the world, but it is the wisdom of God revealed. It's so simple that a child could receive it. We teach the ABCs of the gospel. I know that sounds cliche. It's an acronym, and excuse how cringy that might be, but the acronym works. A stands for admit and repent. Admit and repent. You cannot preach a gospel minus repentance. You cannot preach a gospel without first acknowledging the error of our ways. If people don't 
come to the realization that they're sinful, that they're broken and lost. What need do they have of Jesus? They first must admit and repent of our sin. Believe, B, stands for believe. Believe in Christ's incarnation. Believe in his virgin birth, his miraculous ministry, and his death on the cross. Believe in his resurrection. And then third, C is confess. We must confess him as the Lord of our life. You can, this is not a secret faith. You cannot be ashamed of the gospel. Any man who would deny him on earth, he'll deny you in heaven. But anyone who acknowledges him on earth, he will acknowledge you in heaven. Scripture says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus is Lord, God will save you of your sins and wash them away. You must confess him. And just for fun, I'm gonna add the letter D, deny yourself. Denying yourself is not a prerequisite to salvation, but it is the fruit of someone who is born again. That is the simple gospel. But sadly, many have preached another gospel. Here in the city of Charlotte and around the world, there are four major false gospels that are preached, and I'm gonna expose them really quickly. The first is the prosperity gospel. God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, blessed, and famous. I mean, sounds nice, and at first it's like, oh yeah, I'll sign up for that. But here's the problem. When you get three days into your Christian journey and you realize that there's still struggles, you begin to question, does God love you and are you really saved? It's a misrepresentation of Jesus. Listen, he is a good father. He is gonna make provision for you. Eternity is forever in his glory, in his presence. But God's top priority right here, right now, on this side of eternity is not your material blessing. His number one priority is your salvation and your sanctification. Listen, there's nothing wrong with having nice things so long as nice things don't have you. But the prosperity gospel loses the focus. It puts the focus on the things and the blessings. It's a misrepresentation of Jesus. By the way, if the prosperity gospel was true, how did that work out for the apostles? Those of you that have studied the early church history, you know that they were martyred crucified upside down, sawed in half, filleted alive, shall I continue? Did they prosper on the earth? No, they did not love the world. They loved not their lives unto death and the world was not worthy of them. They did not live for this moment or for gratification on this side of eternity. They lived for him. They gave up their lives for Christ. And any man who clings to his life, you will surely lose it. But anyone who gives up his life freely will find it everlasting. The second false gospel is the Jesus plus gospel. You say, I've never heard of that. Yes, you have. It's the teaching that you need Jesus plus something else to be saved. And this sounds right, and many of you are deceived. You're taken into this. But here's the, war here's the warning. It's not Jesus plus communion. It's not Jesus plus baptism. It's not G Jesus plus tithing. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is, he paid the price in full for your redemption. His blood was more than enough to wash away your every sin. Listen, we are not saved by Christ plus baptism, Christ plus communion, Christ plus good works. No, no, no. We are saved by Jesus, grace through faith alone. What you're really saying when you say we need to add things to our salvation is what you're really saying is his blood was not enough. Oh, I'm preaching to you today. Listen, I'm not saying that we should disregard the ordinances of the church. We just took communion, hello, right? We don't do these things in order to be saved. We do these things because we are saved and it's a huge difference. Does that make sense to you? Some of you are still having a hard time with this, but do you remember on the cross, Jesus was crucified between two criminals? Remember that? And one mocked him and the other received him? Jesus said, surely this day you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say, hey guys, pause, time out, flag on the play. Let's get him baptized real quick so he can die. I'm not trying to belittle it. Baptism is important. It's a commandment, but it's not a prerequisite. It's not what saves you. The apostle Paul even said in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus sent me to preach the gospel, not to baptize. Baptism was a prerequisite for salvation. He wouldn't have said that. It's important. 
It's just not what saves you. It's Jesus alone that saves. Anybody thankful for Jesus and his death on the cross? Yeah. The third false gospel is more than one way gospel. More than one way, many ways gospel, all right? This is the one Oprah is famous for, right? She says, well, there's many roads that lead to Chicago and there are many ways that lead to heaven and Jesus is one of them, sure, but not the only one. Again, this sounds really nice and politically correct and affirming and inclusive and just sounds so good and so caring. The problem is it's heresy. There is one way to the Father and it is through the Son, Jesus Christ. You say, oh, I don't like this sermon. He's being hateful. No, no, I just love you enough to tell you the truth. There's only one way to be saved. It's through Christ. Very simply put, Mohammed didn't die for you. Buddha didn't climb up on the, he couldn't even get up there. He, he didn't die for you. Oh, I'm getting an email. Listen, we should respect all people. I respect your right to disagree with me. I respect Muslims, I respect, I love you, I respect you. But I gotta tell you, I love you enough to warn you, nobody else died for you. And let alone, nobody else had the power to lay down their life and take it up again. Muhammad's still in the grave. Buddha is still in the grave. But our savior, his tomb is empty. He's the resurrection and the life. I don't know about you, but I would not place my eternal security in the hands of someone who was unable to save himself. Ours has triumphed over death in the grave. He's the resurrection and the life. And also, you know, all you coexist friends out there, you know, on YouTube, good morning. Um, you know, here's the thing, and I, I mean this with all sincerity. Do you realize that Islam affirms Jesus as a true prophet? They do. They don't believe he died on the cross and rose again, but they affirm him as a messenger from God. Do you know that the New Age believers, New Age people, they affirm Jesus as a prophet from God? Do you know that uh, Buddhists believe that Jesus is a prophet from God? In fact, many Jews actually will acknowledge Jesus was a prophet sent from God. So the major world religions affirm Jesus as a true prophet, and then the true prophet himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. There is salvation in no other. There is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus. He said, I'm the only way. So if we're just gonna use common sense, the other major religions say he's a prophet. The prophet himself says, I'm the only way. How about let's go with Jesus? Real deep, right? Good morning. He's the way, the truth, and the life, there are not many ways, there's one way. Fourth false gospel is the believe in yourself gospel. Believe in yourself. This one is rampant in Charlotte. The undercurrent is that all humanity is basically good. You be true to yourself, you follow your heart, you live your authentic life. The danger here is that it implies that no repentance necessary. It implies that you're fine the way you are. The problem here is that is not scriptural at all. Romans chapter three says that not one of us is good. Not one of us is truly righteous. Not one of us truly seeks after God. We, our lives are full of wickedness. Someone that would tell you to follow your heart, that's literally the worst advice anyone could ever give you, follow your heart, if you just, you know, if you've ever looked back at your past relationships and were like, thank God I didn't marry her, right? You know, thank God you didn't follow your heart. Tough crowd. Guess you all were perfect, okay. <laughs> Jeez, tough. By 11 o'clock, I've already used these jokes twice, so I know they work, okay? <laughs> Here's the thing. If you follow your heart, it will lead you to hell because the heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Proverbs warns there's a way before every man that seems to be right, but it ends in death. Don't trust your heart, trust Jesus. Galatians chapter one, verse nine, the apostle Paul says, I will say it again, as I've said it before, anyone who preaches any other good news than the one you have welcomed, let that person be accursed. That's how, that's how he felt about false gospels. Third indicator of a false prophet is that you will know them by their fruit. 
You can't fake fruit. Galatians 5.22, this is the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. These are byproducts of abiding in Christ relationally. The fruits of the Spirit begin to flow through your life. You have to be careful, Christian, because not everybody on TikTok, not everybody on Instagram is a true messenger of God. And the truth is they have isolated themselves to where you can't see their fruit through a screen. So be careful. Scripture is warning you that false teachers, they will love money, they will love themselves, they will be prideful, arrogant, and rebellious. If you have a preacher that all they do is talk about money, look out. You have a preacher that's in love with himself, loves him more than he loves you, look out. Jesus called that a hired hand. That's a shepherd that flees when the wolves come. A true shepherd doesn't run from the mess in your life. They jump in with you, love you, and point you the way through. And when scripture calls false prophets rebellious, what it means is they have no accountability, no elders, no oversight. They have a church, but nobody holds them accountable. That's rebellious. It's a dangerous thing to be in a church or follow a leader that's not accountable to anybody. At this church, we have elders and we have overseers. And if I preach some heresy, I'm gonna hear about it on Monday, all right? <laughs> Probably before then, I hope so. All right, we ha you have to submit yourself willingly to accountability. You have to do it. That was the first two verses of 1 John 4. Don't worry, you'll make it. Verses three and four. The spirit of the Antichrist is here. Tell your neighbor, the spirit of the Antichrist is here. This is important, church. The Antichrist is described in the book of Revelation as the beast. He will lift the world from economic catastrophe and global war, ushering in prosperity and peace. The global economic downturn will be the setting of the stage for the Antichrist to take power. This will be an extremely gifted person, politically and with eloquence, and they will set out to deceive the world. They will, many theologians believe, institute a new world order, institute a global economy, and unify world religions. If you're paying attention, the stage is being set in your lifetime for the things and the events in Revelation to come to fruition. The scripture says that we are in the last days, but John warns in this book that we're in the last hours. And if we were in the last hours 2,000 years ago, I would propose to you that today we are in the last minutes, the last seconds before Christ returns to the earth. He could tarry for another 1,000 years. He could come before this sermon is finished. The point is, he's a soon coming king. And you need to make yourself ready I think it's important to see that the enemy, the Antichrist, is not gonna come out and be blatantly evil. He will do great good for the world for a season, deceiving them, earning their loyalty. In fact, he will long to unify world religions, Islam, Christianity, Judaism. He will long to unify them. He will present that they are different expressions of the same God. He will erect a temple where they will share in common masses and common ceremonies together attempting to dilute and unify and minimize the role of Jesus Christ. Church, it's happening right now in the Middle East. The Catholic Church is in conversation right now with Islam leaders and Judaism to do unified joint masses, joint services. The spirit of the Antichrist is at work right now. Do not be deceived. Jesus is not a co-equal. He is king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He reigns in glory, and there is nobody like him. John goes on to say in chapter four, verse four, you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won the victory over those people because greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. He says, I know there's gonna be false teachers. I know there's gonna be false prophets. I know the Antichrist is coming, but you need not fear any of it because you are children of the Most High God and the same spirit that raised Christ 
from the dead is alive inside of you. No weapon formed against you can ever prosper or triumph. If God allows anything to you, it's for his glory and your ultimate good. He is faithful and we will not fear the government. We will not fear the culture. We will not fear the, fear the evil of the age because we know who our father is. Anybody thankful that we have a father in the highest heaven? <laughs> glory to God. We will fear no evil. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you will comfort me. Your rod, your staff, protect me. We have the Holy Spirit within us. He comforts, he convicts, guides, empowers, and affirms the witness of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. The spirit of the Antichrist mentioned here is a mockery of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It is a cheap counterfeit to the working of the spirit in the earth. The spirit of the Antichrist minimizes Jesus, minimizes his word, downplays Christ and his holy church. But the Holy Spirit does the exact opposite. He edifies Christ. He shines a brilliant light into the world. And as you sit in this church right now, the Holy Spirit is active and at work right now through the preaching of his word, the ministry of music, and in the edification of the saints. The Spirit of God is at work right here, right now. He truly is. Verse seven, dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. This is beautiful. Major point here, God is love. The Greek word for knows God is genosko, and I'm probably butchering that, but I'm from West Virginia. Give me grace. The word knows, genosko in Greek, means a knowledge by experience. A knowledge by experience. What John is saying here is he's saying those who have truly experienced God, they will love one another. They will love other believers. They will love their brother and their sister. They will forgive. They will apologize. They will let go of bitterness. They will do good for evil. They will love their enemies. They will do good. They will love in a sacrificial manner. The evidence of someone who is in fellowship and knows God is that they will love their brother and sister. John goes on to say, how can you claim to love a God who you have not seen if you fail to love the people that you do see? If there's hatred in your heart, racism in your heart, bigotry in your heart, if you hate the world, if you hate the community that disagrees with you, doesn't vote like you, doesn't look like you, if you hate the world, then you don't have the love of God in you. The love of God is the barometer. Our love for others is the barometer of our relationship with him. Jesus said, such as you've done unto the least of these, so you've done it unto me. How do you treat people that can do nothing for you? How do you treat people that are the least of these in your life? Are they annoying? Are they a disturbance to you? Or do you listen, care for them, encourage them, edify them, give to them? If you claim to love a God who you haven't seen, but you hate your brother, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you. Listen, if that's where you are today, run to the Father. Run into his loving arms. Pray an honest prayer. Father, help me to love you like I ought to love you. Help me to love my neighbor as I ought to love him. I need your spirit to love through me. Increase my capacity to forgive, to love, to edify and encourage God, love through me. That's a prayer of honesty and humility, and he will answer you. He will meet you in that place of transparency. When John says the word love, it's a Greek word called agape, agape. It means selfless, sacrificial, charitable love without ulterior motives. He loves you even if you do nothing in return. And thanks be to God for his agape love because while I was dead in my sin, lost in my trespasses, unworthy, he loves me anyway. What a mighty God. Scripture tells us in verse 16 that our love is imperfect. Even though we're born again, even though we have a relationship with God, our love for others still fails and is still imperfect. But the mark of a born again Christian is that 
love is present and it's growing ever stronger as we grow more and more in his likeness. The greatest expression of love is seen in Jesus Christ on the cross. If you ever wonder, does God love me? If you ever wonder, does God see me? I want you to think back to the rugged cross erected on Calvary, Golgotha. Remember the love of the Father displayed towards you. The cross is not God's reaction to our sin. It is his premeditated declaration of love towards every man, woman, and child. But there's another facet of love I want you to see in the cross. Not just the sacrifice Christ made for you, but think of the sacrifice the Father made in offering his son. I'm a, I'm a father now. I got two little babies, two little rascals. One is two years old, one is seven months old. I love them immeasurably. It is a love that truly you cannot know. I would die for my children any day, any second, 10 times out of 10, wouldn't even be a thought. If it's them or me, it's me all day, every day. I cannot imagine anything more sacrificial. I cannot think of anything more painful, more riveting than to offer the life of my son for the world. But that is what the Father did for you. Think of it. He offered heaven's very best. Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 9 as the Father giving his son. It's an indescribable gift. In other words, words fail to articulate the offering and the sacrifice that was made for our redemption. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. Oh, church, you didn't wake up and decide to love God. You didn't wake up one morning and say, you know what, I'm gonna get right with God. I'm gonna live right. I'm gonna follow it. No, 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 no. Long before that ever entered into your mind, there was a God who was pursuing you. And by his spirit, he was drawing you to himself, drawing you to repentance. It was not you who loved God, but it was God who loved you you first and while we were lost he was drawing us his mercy his kindness drawing us to repentance and there are some of you in this room today and you are not here by accident you're not here by coincidence you are here this morning because the almighty god creator of heaven and earth has drawn you by his spirit because he loves you and he wants to save your soul We're gonna close the sermon and this series on one of the most beautiful verses in the scripture. 1 John 4, 18. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. The Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear. I used to read that verse and think, well, I've gotta grow in my love and my love has gotta become more perfect so that I won't operate in fear. Oh no, totally misapplying it. It's not our love that's perfect, it's his love that's perfect. And because his love is perfect, it is full, it is complete, it cannot be added to. You and I, who are blood-bought, born-again Christians, need never fear another thing on earth, nor even the judgment of the saints ourselves. Scripture in context here, when it says there is no fear in love, it's actually talking about not the Antichrist, not the false prophets. It's talking about the day of judgment. Scripture says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Make no mistake about it, every one of you, when you draw your last breath, one day you will stand before your creator, the maker of heaven and earth, to give an account for the actions done in the body. Every one of us, there'll be no hiding, no one there to cover us, fully exposed for who we are. You know you're a sinner now, but when you stand on the day of judgment, you'll really know that you're a sinner. You may know that hell is real, but on the day of judgment, you will really know that hell is real. And you know that you're saved, but on the day of judgment, you will really, truly appreciate your salvation. Let me tell you, and I pray you hear me. On that day of judgment, every person in this room and watching, you will be either 
guilty and condemned to eternal suffering, or you will be found blameless, forgiven, righteous, and holy. One of two options. And the reason that we can look forward to that day without fear is because 2,000 years ago, perfect love took the judgment of our sin on the cross. He who knew no sin became my sin that I might be called the righteousness of God in him. Jesus took my wrath, he took my penalty, he took the judgment that I ultimately deserve and instead has called me righteous, blameless, holy and forgiven all by means of the blood of Jesus Christ. I wish somebody would give the Lord praise like you're grateful for the blood that covers our sin. Thank you, Lord. Do you realize that when you repent and confess Christ as the Lord of your life, truly believing it, do you realize that on that day of judgment, there'll be no sin found in you? Because <laughs> it's already paid on the cross. If you're in this room right now and you're not sure if you're right with God, if you're in this room and you're not sure where you'll spend eternity or how you'll be found on that day of judgment, pray with me now all over this place and online. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and we repent of our sin. We acknowledge that we've loved the things created more than the creator himself. Our life has been full of lust, pride, greed, and selfish ambition. Father, have mercy. We repent and we believe that Jesus Christ is the sinless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We believe that he died on the cross, his blood was shed, his body buried, and on the third day he rose from the grave. I give you my past, my present, and my future. Change my heart, change my desires. It's no longer I who live, but now Christ who lives in me. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen.